Hello, and welcome to the Inspired Living with Ellen Broderick podcast. Each week, I have a conversation with someone who in some way is living from a very authentic place within themselves. I, I, I think of it as living from the heart in some way. And in that way is an inspiration to the rest of us to find and live from that place within themselves. And today my uh, guest is Bernard Greenwald. And Bernard is an artist who did his undergraduate, got a BFA from the Philadelphia uh, Museum College of Art and his MFA from the Yale University School of Art and Architecture. Currently, Bernard has a show at the Monument Gallery in Kingston uh, with his stepdaughter, Sasha Pearl. Um, Bernard lives and works in um, uh, Red Hook, uh, New York, uh, lives there with his, his wife. So welcome, Bernard. So glad to have you with me today. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah. So um, tell a little bit, if you will, um, about, let's start with, I know you're going to give us um, some insight into the show itself, but let's start with that. What got you started with art? What what, do you have any uh, recollections, maybe as a, a, a young person, um, of, uh, of of what connected you to art? And well, I've o I, I've always thought of it really as a maker of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was a little kid, I didn't think much about art. I used to make carvings and mm -hmm. little boats and ships and stuff like that, and then. Uh, I went to school. I thought I would become a designer, but that didn't really take. And I went into fine art. And then I became uh, first a printmaker for 50 years and then a painter. Yeah. And you were, uh, you taught printmaking, didn't you, at Bard? I did. Mm -hmm. I taught printmaking mostly and then, uh, and, and drawing. And then later I taught painting and I also taught some writing. Mm -hmm. So tell tell us a little bit about um, about this show and what inspired it and um, and what people who might like to go see it uh, see it um, could expect. Well, um, uh, I'm 81 years old, and I'm not in particularly good health, good poor health, as a matter of fact, and. Uh, so I'm thinking about the end of my life. And um, there was a great German painter, um, Holbein, Hans Holbein, who you might know from his portraits of uh, the wives of Henry VIII. And uh, he was also a designer of uh, prints. And he made a series of 41 prints uh, called Totentanz, which means the dance of death. And um, he lived in a time, I guess it was the 16th century, when there was the plague, the Black Plague was uh, rampant, and there were wars all over the place, the Crusades, the um, Inquisition, uh, great unrest, populations moving around, fleeing from here to there and for better circumstances. And um, it's a lot like what's going on today. And um, so uh, these prints show uh, various uh, people, figures, going about their lives. And death is a skeleton. And he's kind of a smart-ass guy. And he creeps up on them and grabs them. And that, and he uh, he shows that uh, a bishop is is grabbed just the same way as a uh, a uh, fashionable lady is, or a younger child is, or in other words, nobody is safe from the uh, scourge of death. And um, he makes a mockery of it, like when he's grabbing the bishop. He pulls off the bishop's mitre and puts it on his head. And uh, it's just a, an impish thing. And um, so when you look at them, you're uh, horrified and also amused. They're really funny. And uh, they're really about life in a certain way. They're about how 
how do you remain alive in the face of things that are so devastating and dangerous? And um, so I embarked on a series of paintings of uh, people dancing with death. And similarly, I think they're, they're, no, they're not whole bodies, but I think that they are, uh, they're color studies, they're good to look at, uh, and they are funny. And uh, they show that uh, I may be, uh, my, my body might be diminishing, but my spirit is not. I'm, I'm, I paint every day, and I painted all the paintings for this show in about three months. And uh, I'm very active, and, and I intend to stay alive until I finally leave this earth. Yeah, you know, um, the thing that uh, that really impressed me when I was looking at um, some of, of the uh, the paintings on online um, uh, on Facebook, I um, the, the the colors are so vibrant and um, uh, and the textures that you get with um, with your patterns um, are, are really alive. And then you have these skeletons which are uh, they're also quite lively but um but um minimalist <laughs> and, yeah, and, cool. and and these things are um uh juxtaposed and right. sometimes overlaid as well yeah right there's a series too where you're where where there are faces that are looking at their skeletons and right um, and that also impresses me in terms of like our ability to look at that aspect as we're living. Can we look at at the finiteness of it? Um, well, um, nobody really wants to talk about that. You know, I I have uh, three grown children, and they. You know, I don't want to impose this. I don't want to impose this on them. My wife doesn't really want to talk about it. She has to deal with it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes one a little lonely unless you have contemporaries that you can share and say, oh, yeah, I can no longer stand up. Or, oh, yes, I can no longer uh, do this or that by myself or whatever. Mm -hmm. And unless you have a, um, uh, uh, a coterie of people that you can rely on it's very lonely we as we get older our our um, our friends are less and less and our contacts are less and less so it's hard so the paintings have helped me express that into the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i i can remember as my mother aged um that that the hardest thing for her was losing one friend after another and, yeah. and then feeling just a smaller and smaller group of, of intimate friends. Right. Yeah. And so, it's also uh, old age is like in a certain way, like being an adolescent, when you're an adolescent, you wake up one morning and say, Oh, there's hair growing there. Oh, there's a temple here. And when you're old, you're saying, Oh, this arm doesn't move anymore. Yeah. Oh, that I can't stand on that leg. And it's very similar, it's full of surprises, except the outcome in adolescence, while you might not realize it, is much better than the outcome when you're old. If if your um if your children um uh were anxious to hear what you had to say about this, what would you want to tell them? Pretty much what I'm telling you. Um, yeah, and and um, uh, one of my sons is a uh, fourth year medical student, mm -hmm. and the other one is a uh, psychotherapist. So I know that they're equipped to listen to all this stuff, and if I ask them to listen to it, they will. But I remember as a child, when my grandfather spoke to me a little bit in this way, I really didn't know what to do with it. And uh, I would like this, I would like to offer them the tools for dealing with it if if such tools exist. 
And each time I have suggested that to them, they say, oh, uh, we, we, we'll, we know how to deal with it. It'll, it'll be okay. So, What tools have you found helpful to you as you're going through you know, aging and, and illness? Well, I, 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 I express myself in jokes and it's really annoying to a lot of people and sometimes even to myself, but um, that helps a great deal and uh, it helps to make new friends. And I, I play music, I play the cornet and I'm taking banjo lessons and uh uh and and i play in a band i have a band and uh that's a great pleasure to uh in the band there are people of all ages and we all play together and many of us have been together for almost 15 years so that's a very wonderful thing is it um, klezmer music? Because I, I remember years ago that was a, a big interest of yours. Really? I, I didn't know that you would remember that. Yeah, yeah it's a klezmer, klezmer band. Yeah. Um, and I also remember that jazz was something that really lit you up. I love, I love jazz, but I never got competent enough to really play it. Play it. Mm -hmm. klezmer, klezmer music. It's written down, and it's uh, you know it's a limited genre, so one can one can begin to master it. But jazz is that's like classical music. That's tough. I'm gonna just I have a couple of quotes from in here, and this is I'm I'm reading from this um, write up on um, on how to make a painting. Um, Done your research. Well, you got to You got to be uh, you know trying at least get the information you can. But anyway, it's a terrific write up about, about how to make a painting because it, it has in it some very practical um, suggestions and 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 seems to follow a process that you do use. But then you have quite a bit of humor in it as well. And um, uh, and and but one of the things that was I thought on the more serious side, but. Uh, was that you listen to uh, some jazz sometime for inspiration as you are painting? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I did. Now mostly I have the computer next to me and I'm watching um, YouTube and I've become an expert on many uh, disparate skills. <laughs> So you can paint and watch at the same time, or do you mostly? No, I, I can listen yeah. and watch, and I can glance over. Yeah. I'm going to just, I have a couple of quotes from in here, and this is, I'm, I'm reading from this um, write-up on, um, on how to make a painting. Um, but one of the things that you say is... Um, clarify you've already done a drawing you've gone out you've been on site you've you've gotten the the drawing part down then you're you're choosing uh you're choosing color i'm sorry you're choosing color that will complement uh the drawing and will vibrate optically the most um well I, i'm choosing complementary colors i think is oh I mean. oh, oh okay mm -hmm. you're choosing complementary colors that will so the colors are vibrating. They're helping each other. Yeah, vibrate. yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, that that was a series that I did some years ago. And um, I would go out and draw from nature, but the color was not natural. And the color was totally invented and intended to be as wild and crazy. And the, the landscapes were not intended to be, you know, Matisse said, uh, that he he thought his painting should be like an armchair that it, after work a man could sit down in his armchair, look at his paintings and relax. And I think it should be the opposite. So uh, get you out of your chair. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think it should. They should be very exciting to look at, mm -hmm. full of yeah. electricity and yeah. life. And you say uh, mix new colors and try to surprise yourself with them. Right. Um, and then I loved this. You said, um, stay calm and try to see what you are doing, not confuse it with what you hope you are doing. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Artists 
have all kinds of tricks for trying to see the painting fresh. So like sometimes I'll come in in the morning and I'll peek around the edge of the door and I look at the painting or I leave the painting upside down during the night and I you know, peek at it. And I always joke with my wife that the elves were working on it during the night and maybe they finished it, whatever. <laughs> I would it's a pleasure that. to talk with someone who's really interested in my work. I appreciate it very much. Oh, you know, I, I love the colors that you come up with and the patterns and but also the compositions. You know, this your 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 paintings really tell a story in and of themselves. And oh, I think cool. part of the reason that it's easy to see it freshly is because the colors are not expected. You know, they're not the they're not what you would see out in nature, you know. Yeah. So you have a nice combination of the two things. Um and then you had another, um, um, how can you make the forms in the painting pass from darkness to light in some orderly way, in the way it feels to drive a car through the landscape? Right. Wow. I didn't want to just paint a picture. I'm not interested in painting a picture of the landscape. I'm interested in somehow evoking the experience of being in the landscape. Mm -hmm. Especially where we live in the Hudson Valley, it can be very colorful and wonderful. Like we, we just, we have just lost uh, the peak of our uh, leaves mm -hmm. turning. So that's just about over. But even now, the lawn, which used to be green, is now yellow with leaves. And it reflects the light in a much different way. And so I lament. I lament leaving, le losing the leaves, but I really love this one moment where everything gets so luminous. Yeah, that brings me back to where we started with this around death, because uh -huh. I think about that every fall. You know that the that the that the the leaves really show us the way to you know be that vibrant, luminescent explosion. Yeah, um, you know, prior to they're completely letting go. And also, um, I find that at my age, I'm counting the springs that I'm going. I love the spring, mm -hmm. and uh, I count them now. I, have, I don't. I know now that I don't have an infinite number of them to look forward to. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm very uh, stingy with them, thinking about them and experiencing them, whatever. Does that come into other things? It seems to me that when something is finite, um, that is precious, there's something that happens in which your awareness of its preciousness um, is, is yeah. eliminated. Yes, I think so. Yeah. You know, another thing that has always impressed me about you is, um, is the importance of family to you um, mm -hmm. and family life. So how does that how does that interplay with with family life um, and with the ones that you love? Well, um, when I was a small child, my father uh, abandoned us. I I saw him one or two times again, and then never again. Never heard from him my whole life, and I one does not forget about that. It's uh, it's like a little a demon sitting on one shoulder. And uh, I determined that I was always uh, w whatever, I was going to be the best father to my children that I possibly could, or at least the most attentive father. And to, make, to my great frustration and distress, I mimicked him by divorcing their mother. We just weren't getting along. And, uh, and then, uh, but I never, you know, I didn't, like when, when you used to babysit for them, I would drive from Red Hook to Kinderhook, pick them up in Kinderhook, take them to your house, which was, I don't know, another half hour. And then I would drive back to Red Hook, teach my class, get back in the car, drive back to your house, drive them back to Kinderhook, 
it was like a 60 mile round trip twice a day. And it's just like, you know, every moment with them was precious. And both of them really still seemed to like me. They talk with me on the phone and we get along and, you know, I don't, I don't tell them what to do. And uh, it's, it's wonderful. And my stepdaughter who came into my life when she was about seven, um, similarly, we, we found a great way to get along and it's been wonderful. I always say it's the, it's the most interesting enterprise, uh, including art that I have ever taken part in raising children. I just love that. What about it? What about it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Seeing their, uh, seeing that, seeing how they uh, have the courage or not to face the world as it unfolds around them. And when they have the courage to uh, go along with them and celebrate it with them. And when they don't have the courage to encourage them and make them understand that they can go out in the world. I mean, I guess that's why the death thing is not so important to them because I've been teaching them all my life how to get along without me. They're, they're uh, both, of, they're all interested in art. They all make, well, they don't make art, but they're interested in it. They all have all made good marriages and uh, they all seem interesting and uh, and good people. And I don't mean to, um, I don't mean to deny the effect of their mother and their stepmother. I didn't do it by myself. What do you have left to do? What do you have yet to do? That, that That's going to be um, on the horizon. I know that that uh, that this it sounds to me like this um, uh, this art show is a it's it's a really a, a big reflection of of your internal life sort of having a place to express itself um, and maybe even a start to to conversations that that um, that could be important to you with other people and maybe some. Well, we're having one right now. This is really great. Um, what remains? Just more of the same, and and savoring it. Mm -hmm. I I always, I always knew, I always knew about the impermanence of things in life, uh, even as a young child, mm -hmm. and like with our band, I always say to them, you know, it's wonderful that we have this band, but it won't last forever. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, COVID came along, and it destroyed the band for several years, mm -hmm. and now. We have it again. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just uh, to recognize that life is not, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a series of events that you seize and that you can hold on to. If you, if you grasp it too tightly, you destroy it. It's like a thist thistle, thistle. Mm -hmm. See, I would, like to, I would like to be able to say that word articulately again. Uh, but it's just more of the same. I want to stay alive until I'm not alive anymore. Well, you had, um, there There was a line, it was at the end of, of a write-up that you had for your show. And as an aged, aged man in poor health, preoccupied with death, I'm still vibrantly alive. Yeah. I remember that my grandfather, when he was an old man, he, um, this was an accusation of his son that he sat down in a chair and he waited for a decade to die. And um, I don't, I'm not doing that. I mean, if I can, um, two of my fingers on my left hand don't work anymore. So I found a teacher that would teach me the banjo using only the three last fingers. And uh, that's been really fun and enjoyable and rewarding. Will I ever go on the stage playing the banjo? I doubt it. Will people ever sit around asking me to play the banjo for them? I doubt it. But it's just, you know, it's, I just love it. Mm -hmm.
this idea of, of, of really living until we die, I think is a good message for everyone because um, my experience during the pandemic was that um, people saw what they couldn't do, but not necessarily what they could do. Right. And, and my experience in life is that um, when, when some things become difficult, um, there are openings in, in other places that had not been there before or that I had not seen before. Yeah. I wonder if you experienced that. Well, you know, I, um, uh, one of my travails during COVID, I never really got seriously sick with COVID, but I had, uh, three knee operations and I had, I had an operation on my heart and then I got a general infection. I had to stay in the hospital with IVs for six weeks. Uh, and in rehab, um, my wife, Elena, brought me my paints and I set up in the corner of my room a little studio and I was painting. And um, I don't know why this seems so important but um, I got paint on the floor and I got some paint on the wall and stuff. And I think they, they were very gracious to me at the rehab place, not realizing that that, that, that paint will never come off. Mm. It's uh, acrylic paint. You can't remove it once it dries. So I have a monument there, if nothing else. <laughs> There were a number of um, of a series that I thought were 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 pretty compelling. One was a car wash, and let me yeah. just ask you this: what's the what's what's the draw for you of a car wash? Because you had quite a few paintings of this particular car. Well, wash. I think it was in Red Hook. Yeah, it makes your car clean, and you experience that you're inside the car while it's getting all this soap and water sprayed on it and big brushes are going it's very dramatic and exciting and i always like it and when i was with the kids i would teach them all to scream at the top of our lungs as we were going through so i always enjoyed it and you know uh it's part of daily life that no one thinks about that, that i think about actually and um uh, i don't know it's um and it's all about rebirth and uh, and uh, I never think of the word. You know, you, you go in dirty, you come out clean. It's like it's like being born. It's it's great. Yeah. Let's let's Only end it on that. Solid. Let's end it on that note. <laughs> Bernard, thank you so much. And um, no, your, uh, your website is be Bernard uh, Greenwald dot com, maybe. Could be. Okay. At any rate, if you if you um if you Google um Bernard Greenwald art, um your your uh site will come up and um and there's lots of really good information on there, including the uh piece on um on how to how to paint uh how to make a painting. May I say something to you? Mm -hmm. It's uh a frustration that I work primarily alone every day it's kind of lonely and uh, most people are not interested in finding out that much about me and having this kind of an in-depth and uh fun conversation so i'm very grateful to you i'm grateful that you invited me and i'm grateful that you did so much homework thank you very much well, you know, it's been really a treat for me and um and I and I've loved sort of diving back into your work and and seeing the new things completely fresh. So You're very sweet. Thank you. So for inspired living with Ellen Broderick, thank you all for joining us.